it's a big surprise to be sitting here. I had no plan to be here. I was, um, but I'm glad to be here sitting next to two of my closer friends and uh, somebody that I recently got to know. Um, on my talk, Azmin Izadeh, sitting to my left, is an internationally acclaimed writer, filmmaker who studied with Abbas Kiarostami in Iran and whose work explores the subjectivity of children and adolescents who have suffered from trauma, both serious and subtle forms. Uh, Mohammad Gorgestani is an award-winning filmmaker of remarkable documentaries and fiction films that explore marginalized communities and characters. And I was informed that his film just won a, a prize at South by Southwest, the Fuge. Yep. Congratulations. Merci. Uh, Marjan Mogimi is an award-winning film producer and founder of Butima Productions, who started making films with my brother, actually, uh, with Bahman. Um, in the Bay Area, whose films often center on Iranian art and artists, especially painters, poets, and musicians. Uh, I think the plan is to see some films by all three, and then come back <laughs> to the panel and have a Q&A. Uh, we're going to start with uh, you, with Anahita, and then go to Mohammad and then Marjan. Thank you. A little louder. How y'all doing, my brother? Assalamu alaikum, my little brother. How y'all doing today? Yes. All right. You ladies go through a lot, and y'all do it with a lot of courage. Now, all of you, you're beautiful. And I need you to feel good about yourselves. We're going to start in this corner here. And I want you to just introduce yourself and tell me something good about you. Well, my name is Teresa. Something good about me. Um, I'm a good mother. Beautiful. Come on with it. Give me some of you. Give me some of you. Uh, hi, my name is Tawanda. I'm a beautiful black African-American female. I'm loving Could you Tyler. say that one more time? I'm a beautiful black African-American woman. I love that. I have five kids, and um, at the age 12, I was told I wasn't going to be shit, mount to nothing. Come on. Or none of that. Okay. <coughs> okay. We're good. Now, ladies, let me share something with you. There was a time in my life when I didn't feel there was any good in me at all. And the reason for that is because I was sitting on that side where you guys are today. I had to go inside myself and find something good about me. When I got back from Iraq, my wife noticed that I was angry, that I was anxious, that I was struggling with depression, anxiety. It wasn't me anymore, and she was afraid of who I was. I assumed that she was just going to leave. Her dad is Grant Ironlining Jr. Her grandpa's Grant Ironlining Sr. 
and then I can't remember his dad's name, but it's five generations back, is Chief Iron Lightning. He could walk anywhere and he could just come back with horses. And that made him a leader to the Lakota people. This is where my great grandpa Iron Lightning was buried. Mm -hmm. This is Dale Iron Lightning. He's one of my uncles. Yes, that's who I was named after. Knowing that I come from these great people, I feel like I have to do big things, you know? Yeah, The INS and Pentagon are expected to release a joint public statement. I haven't done anything wrong. I am simply reading what I have in front of me. been using the puberty blocker to, as we've said, hit a pause button and make sure that you're not progressing through a puberty that you just don't want. And I think you've been able to explore things about yourself and, you know, about the whole transition that makes sense. Can I ask my question? How would you like me to introduce you tonight? Do you want me to say you're Lawrence? Or I can just say that we call you day? If they ask, you can just say I'm Lauren's sibling, a brother. I do not mean to complain. They say it is my fault. Nobody tells me anything. Tell me how old I am. The deepest demarcations can slowly spread and fade. I guess. So she said that we can do some tests to see if I'm really a girl or not. What kind of tests? Like, she said that I should keep a piece of paper and write down who I am in the morning as soon as I wake up. You did that? Yeah, it's a row. Like, girl, girl, boy, boy, girl. I could just write B, G, blank, if I don't know. Is that J? Where are they going? من میتونم یه کم دیگه به زنگ بزنم و این کار برم پیشون بده چه با نمیگین؟ چی ها؟ چیزی شده؟ با مریضه؟ نگرن شرط ویزا اینا من جیبا بگم وقت بر ندید من که توی این برزخ گیر کردم اندخوا مشخصی هم ندارم از واقعا هم دستمون نگرفتم میخوام جیبا بگم به چی؟ What is my age? Tell me how old I am The moon go hang The stars go fly their kites I want to know my age Tell me how old I am I 
I want to mention that uh, Anayta Ghazvinizadeh's film was premiered at Cannes Film Festival in 2017, I think. And Nedon Nobari was one of the backers, I think, executive producer, maybe. بلیت یک طرفه که میخری لابد مطمئنی که چرا داری میری و اونجا چه کار خواهی کرد ولی وقتی هواپیما به سمت غرب پرواز میکنه فقط ثانیه ها نیستند که به عقب برمیگردن تو هم برمیگردی اونقدر عقب که تردیدها همه برمیگردن کجا دارم میرم چرا دارم میرم من که راه امرار معاشم کلمه بود میرم اونجا لال بشم مگه چقدر انگلیسی بلدم Just a Chibu in Bamitalto. 
Ben hiç fikir ne kimde var eşki çi bu evet. O bara bir bu kızı ter bana bu. Ter katı ya hamişe çi mi kona önce kader. Rasvetali yaknani grushi paplili tumani nadrekoi pratako katugolubi. Kat kat kat. İn musiqi zamin aşk kupas şamşi. Nemunam. Zap kardı budam. Nemunam şu paksan şu. Murat kujas. Murat. مراد مراد روسی خوند دیگه شما به من گفتی یه ترانه محلی ایرانی این ترانه خیلی هم زیباست خیلی هم داره جنشوز خوبش جان اصلا کسی این رو نمیفهمه الان ترانه محلی ایرانی بود شما میفهمیدی ایرانی که بود اینجا یه رادیو استیشن ایرانیه مراد ببینی چه شما سین سازه خانم عزیز هدفمون این بود که موسیقی همسایه های ایران رو معرفی کن متاسفانه روسیه دیگه همسای ایران نیست. یه دقیقه قطعش کن. مراد تو بیاین. اما آماده این. از اول میرم. برو. راس به تالی یقلانی گروشی پاپ لیلی تو مانی نده کوی بی خادی لنابری کتیوشا نابی سو کش بیره Posius money, devush ko price to yo. Posius ni she kaka na yo. Posion zem di yo piri shudrat nu yo. Ali vov kadiushes piri shud. Afel, afel. Alta dige bat yekani fikaram bishter tamir kone. حالا با هم دیگه بعدا تمرین میکنم من آقای افشار اگر اجازه بدی برم آفیس خودم یکمی کار دارم جوان کشتی بلدی؟ Thank you, thank you all. Um, so I want to ask you a very quick question, uh, just one sentence to give you, to give us a little background that where were you born, where were you <laughs> grew up, uh, and when did you move to America, if you, if you live here? I think it gives us a sense about the, like where's home, where's, like how do you deal with the immigration, because it's very different when you, were born here or came here at a very early stage or after you finished your school, for example, in your case, Lena? Um, <clears throat> I was born in Iran in 1984. My dad and uh, my dad was uh, 
an art professor at Tehran University, focusing on graphic design and fine art. Um, my mom was one of his students. Um, they stuck it out because my dad had actually come back to the U.S. or to Iran from the U.S. Um, and I think the war is what was kind of the, the the the straw that broke the camel's back, and then we mo we moved to San Jose, um, California in 1988, and I've more or less been in the Bay Area ever since. Um, I was actually born here in um, Miami, Florida, uh, but we moved back when I was nine months old and then came to the U.S. when I was 13 for high school. And then I didn't go back to Iran until 1983. And then after that, I started going back regularly. But I hadn't been gone for a long time. Thank you. I was born in 1989 in Iran, and I lived in Iran until 2011. So I did all my undergrad, my basic education, and work in Iran. And then I uh, moved to Chicago in 2011, and I've been living in Chicago, then a few other places right now in Iowa. So it's from 2011 to now, I've been living in the U.S., um, and I haven't been back since 2011. So, yeah. so one of the questions that I have a lot on my mind these days is authenticity. Uh, what does it mean? And is it if it's important or not at all? Um, and I think as immigrants, we have a bigger question or bigger challenge with authenticity. And my question is, how do you deal with First of all, is it important to have something authentic? And what does it mean? And also, do you think it's important to tell the story of yourself or the story of others? Because through films, you're, make, you're telling a story. Is it about you or is it about somebody else that you saw from outside? Uh, who, who's next? Do you want to start? Sure. OK. Um, yeah, that's the question. I think about that question a lot, too. Um, I think when when I started telling stories and when, when I was like more in the beginning part, I was thinking a lot about this is about me. And the more I go on, I realize it is coming from my experience, but I'm not telling my story. So, for example, about they, the focus was not from the beginning consciously about there's a self-reflection, there's about me and my subjectivity and myself and my life. This is about an other that I imagined and I thought about, but then it's organically through the process that whatever is added to it to create this, you know, imaginative world is coming from my real experience. So I think it's the construct of a story and the characters, I objectively look at them as like these fictional characters and figures, but at the end, like all the parts are coming from my real firsthand experience. So um, in terms of if authenticity matters, absolutely. And I think for me, one of the most important things is something is authentic to me that is, I, I actually recently I've been thinking a lot about it, that is beautiful and meaningful for me. So I don't feel the pressure that I have to like politically or ideologically have a frame or certain theme to insert myself in the world. It's a story that organically has, you know, some meaning and beauty for me. And then I try to be authentic to the story it itself more than anything, if that helps, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, it's um, very important um, for me when I started producing films. I think I was looking at projects that um, uh, uh, was close to what I was feeling at the time um, when we were talking about um, an immigrant experience, and I think she was, was the one who mentioned that it's a process of becoming and not just being. Um, originally, when I started producing films, I was at a uh, stage where, for me, um, everything was nostalgic about Iran, so I wanted to go there. I wanted to work with Iranian filmmakers who were living there. I wanted to experience Iran through their eyes, because I hadn't been there for a long time. And I think that's why I um, chose documentaries, because I thought they were the most authentic way of telling stories. But um, after like six or seven films, and once I started going back and forth, um, I realized that um, that shifted in me. And for me, my Iranianness was more inside of me. Um, so I didn't feel the um, need to go back anymore. And I started focusing on stuff that were happening here. And um, which was 
the um, story of immigrants here. So again, it was um, important to be authentic, to um, use stories that were real, not something that um, you read about in the papers. But actually, there were friends of mine who were going, for example, for Radio Dreams, it was based on actual stories of um, Iranian artists who were living here. And that inspired me to actually make my first feature, narrative feature, um, although it was not a documentary, but I wanted to stay through to the um, authentic um, version of what immigrants are going here. So yeah, so I would say it's extremely important. Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, for me, I've kind of decided to, to settle on this, this perspective that I'm gonna make work about things I care about. And when I'm s thinking about a project, I have to be able to have some sort of experience that can help me understand that subject matter. Um, but my work is, you know, I, I carry um, and represent um, uh, class struggle through my work because that's what I had growing up. I was poor. My family was poor. Um, you know, we we had a hard time transitioning, especially for my, my, my dad who couldn't really take what his status was as a, as a, as a teacher of, of art in Iran and translate that to working in the university level in the United States. And he had to find a way to reinvent himself as a jewelry repairman. Um, and, you know, so I think the authenticity level is, for me, is more about, um, you know, things that make me uh, feel that I'm being connected to how I was um, raised and brought up. And for me, I can't decouple that by, by not making work that represents the kind of people who uh, aren't really um, able to even <laughs> think about these things because they're too busy you know, trying to make their next paycheck to survive and the stresses of living in a capitalistic society have, have beaten them down year after year, generation after generation. And they can't even get to a place where they can have, they can indulge these conversations because the stress of their uh, economic status and their so, you know, their, the way they land into the, into, into the classes of, of this country have not allowed them to um, grow. So when I'm thinking about authenticity, I'm just making sure that I'm staying true to the people I represent. I, I want to add something, because both of these answers made me think a lot. Um, this is a huge topic, authenticity, its relation to truth, to reality. Like, what do we mean by realism if, like, reality is something that is authentic in our work? And this is a very good point, because um, I'm now a teacher. I teach screenwriting. So we talk about, for example, um, Aristotle talks about, okay, tragedy comes from the story of real families, but once you are dramatizing it, you should think of what is good for the drama itself, the good of the art in itself, even though it is based on real stories. And we've been talking about like fictionalizing like what is a true account or this is based on reality, but once you are fictionalizing how much you want to remain truthful to what actually happened, and it happens a lot that students figure that when they want to stick to the <laughs> reality, it doesn't become a good enough story. So sometimes you have to change things through the texture of drama or construct of drama. Um, so, but for example, and another side of it is like Russia, late 19th century. Is Dostoevsky more authentic about what is going on there? Or pieces of newspaper, Dostoevsky, <laughs> most probably. He has the essence, the authentic essence of the time. So I think this is a question, especially for storytellers or for narrative filmmakers, about how you are touched and affected by your time in a truthful way that when you fictionalize it, you don't have to like stick to the you know details of what actually happened, but through the essence and through the construct of the story, you reflect the authentic spirit of the time. That's what came to my mind based on both answers, so, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so how much time do we have? We have 10, 12 minutes. 12 minutes, okay. Which I talked all that uh, time, so we don't have it. I have um, <laughs> another question. So when you talk about authenticity, do you also talk about your? Do you also think about your audience and the relationship between authenticity and audience? Because sometimes it's very difficult to keep both. So do you think you have to make compromises when you, or do you even think about that? 
Uh, actually, is it part of the... Yeah, yeah. sorry to interrupt. But sure. Actually, that's something that as a producer um, comes to my mind all the time. But I also think you can be authentic and having your audience in mind. For example, once we made Radio Dreams, even though it was very successful in terms of winning prizes and you know um, traveling globally, and now it's um, on Amazon, actually, if you want to watch it. But um, the audience that we were expecting to get was not as great as it got. And most of it had to do with the fact that 90% of the film was in Farsi, and it was subtitled. And that's one of the biggest problems we have. So for the next film that I'm working on, and this is something that you said, do you think about it? We really thought about it. We wanted to stay um, authentic to the storyline, but we also wanted to reach a global audience because the, the topics that we choose, especially when dealing with immigrants, we all know the stories. It's mostly the American or the Western audience that you want to capture. So we decided to choose a topic that would give us the opportunity to also make the film in English. So the, the next project is about this Afghan translator. But because she's a translator, she has the ability to speak English. So it would make sense for the film to be in English. So even though you know, we, we still tell the story of an immigrant, there is a reason why she's speaking English. It's not just made in English you know, per se, just to make money. But there is a reason she was a translator. She's here. So the, a lot of thought went into it. But this way, we're hoping to reach a global, you know, a greater audience. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this is the, the, the million dollar filmmaking question of how do you make stuff that, that is art and how does it also be viable? Um, I think every filmmaker thinks about that. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, me personally, um, I've decided that my short form, my, my perspective on the work that I'm doing, especially in the short form as I'm developing a feature film has been, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with how things are in this country. I'm not happy with how things are, uh, even on my side of the political spectrum. I think the Democratic Party and the liberal movement is, is, is, needs a lot of help and correction right now. So I, my work tries to infiltrate. And I think the way I've been able to do that and make it sustainable has been to actually, um, I, I try to get most of my short films to be commissioned by brands. And there's a very specific reason for that. The economic viability, but also I know that that's gonna get pushed out outside of the echo chambers of the art world. It's gonna get pushed and presented in front of people who are simply consumers. And I'm willing to sacrifice 5% of my artistic integrity to know that I'm actually making something that's gonna get seen by somebody that doesn't think how I think. And that's really important to me. On the, uh, and then on the feature film side, which is more of an economic uh, industry and business, I think you know, when you have very talented producers who, who, who have answers like she just did, you're able to take a story and see how you can actually shift it, adjust it, package it, whatever, what have you, make tweaks on it that also makes it, makes it viable. Look, like, I think there is a way to make art that you care about and is exactly authentic to who you are and to make that economically viable. And I think there is a, it's, it's not easy, but I think that um, it is doable. I think, you know, films like Moonlight have proven that. Would you compromise your authenticity? Would I compromise? Well, what's the goal? That's the question. That's so the goal is the important question. And for me, with my short form work, you know, I'm trying to get people, you know, this last film, uh, I made that we, we won the prize at South by Southwest. That was a film about a uh, tour, tour combat vet from, from Iraq who started a ballet company. And I chose that subject matter very specifically because I wanted to speak um, to the conservative people by making them think they're watching a film about patriotism, but actually instill completely liberal values and progressive values into that. Um, you know, because that's, I mean, that's, I don't, I'm trying to change what they think. You know what I mean? Did I compromise two to 5% of that narrative? Because like, it's, it's no different than like working with a studio. You know, the studio is gonna give you more notes than an independent picture. So I'm willing to, because my goal was very specific for me, that I was willing to adjust the scene based on some notes from, an, from like at an executive level. Now there's a, if they wanna change it 20%, I'm not gonna do that. But I'll, I'll stay within the 5% 
if that gets my goal across, because I'm trying to make work that actually changes things. Well, what do you want to make up? Well, I, I think that there is me as the artist and the work and the people who are with me as makers, and then there, there are these whole like structures and platforms for marketing and presenting my, my film, and then there are the viewers. When I'm making as a maker, I think about individual viewers. I think about a human being and how humanly the film would affect them. And it's it's not very pleasant for me. Even like for my film when it is shown as like in this group of films that are about gender identity or in this group of films that are about Iranians, that's not necessarily where I'm meeting my viewer in the process of making. I'm, I've made a bunch of short films and a feature, but I am still know myself as a beginner. And so, I don't know, maybe in the future I get more into the considerations of like targeting specific communities and thinking about the marketing process, but that's the last thing I wanna think about when I'm making the work. Um, I think about individuals. I imagine my friends, my family, and people, and think about how deeply the human content of the film can touch them. And that may sound really naive to most of the artists, but that's that's the level that I think about it. Rather than seeing my film in the structure, I see myself like in my living room showing the film to a friend and imagine which parts my friend would be touched by or which which parts would trouble her. And that's how I have my <laughs> viewer in my head when I make work. And is there an element, this is a question for all of you, is there an element of Iranianness that's written here in your work? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the first six or seven documentaries that I produced um, had um, that nostalgic feeling that I had um, about Iran. I mean, I wanted to go back, I wanted to travel, I wanted to explore as much as Iran as I could, so I concentrated on musicians and artists and everything that I could just, I was inhaling Iran by those films. But um, not really, the past few films, um, there is some Iranianness, but it's not necessarily, um, from that point anymore, it has what is that Iranianness view? To right now or, or before? Right now. Right now, it's more of a community um, that it's not necessarily just Iranians anymore. It's a community of like-minded people that um, share my values or my taste, basically, and that's what's driving me um, in my filmmaking career. Like even one of the projects that I have has nothing to do with Iran, and it's not mm -hmm. being um, even directed by an Iranian, so. Yeah, I mean, um, the Iranianness to me is, it, it goes, for me, yeah, I mean, I think I'm trying to remind people about the things that actually matter, and I think I I Iranian culture to me, when I look at it about what our culture sh actually values, I mean, it's a culture that values art and poetry and things that aren't, those are the things of status, you know what I mean? And I think the Iranian side that's been, um, that's part of this diaspora, especially in, in the immigrant experience in this era of America, you're being constantly persecuted, you're being constantly being forced to kind of um, uh, prove your worth to that. I, you know, our, our community contributes. We have all these like really great, you know, uh, tech CEOs and, and, and you know, all these, con but to me, like when I go back to that, like I'm my Iranianness makes me say, no, that's not the only people that matter. All these people on the bottom matter too, because that's what my culture has taught me. That's what my mother's taught me, you know. So, um, so I guess when I think about the Iranianness, I'm not thinking about a physical, uh, the, the physical element of, it, element of it. I'm thinking a bit of it more from a from a moral place, personally. I should say very fast to have time. My Iranianness is poetry, I think. Yeah. And I got a big part of my education in Iran, thanks to your father. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know very well Mr. Kiarostami was my teacher, how poetry is important. We were like reading and reciting and poetry with him all the time. And that really touched me. I come from like an education, like maybe many people here have memorizing tons of poetry. It's and it's not only like an ornamental addition to life. It, it was, I think, core of my culture. It's what connects me with my history. And the way I think about, for example, directing a scene, 
that like th that this and that detail would show like the entirety of this room like that comes a lot from poetic like e um, you know like extraction or like poetic devices and um, ways of seeing and showing the world and I think like deeply I'm inspired by that culture whatever I make whether it's in Farsi or English comes from a way of seeing the world that's been for me touched deeply by um, and really rich culture of poetry so Thank you. I want to shamelessly yes uh, take a minute to say something about uh, what I'm doing I'm working on <laughs> which is related to this and it's also related to Neda in, in one way um, I just launched a residency program in France with Neda Nobody Foundation's uh, support thank you for that which how it started was I believe borders, they used to be vertical. Like Iranians, we as Iranians had more things in common with each other than with somebody from France. And people in France, they had more things in common with each other than somebody from Mexico, for example. But now borders, they have become horizontal. Like if you look at top 1%, they have more things in common with each other than with the rest of the people of their own country. And even when you look at the the, the right side of the spectrum of both countries, Iran and America, even though they hate each other, they have more things in common, even the literature that they use. Uh, they call us axis of evil, we call them shaitan buzurk. Even the words sometimes are similar. Well said. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a group, there's a country there, I call it called people who like culture, um, different forms of culture in any form, I call it Kulturistan. That's the name of the residency program that I'm hoping to expand, uh, bring immigrants to that country, culture of Um And Iranian-ness, part of it is there, but I feel, I personally feel more connected sometimes from somebody from Mexico than some of the Iranians in LA who are the same age. We moved here, we had the same experience in Iran, we came here at the same time, but we don't have a lot in common. But I have more in common with somebody from Mexico, somebody, somebody from France. Um, and authenticity is the question that we have for the first residencies. And again, I want to thank Nedo Nobel for making that possible. Thank you. I think, uh, do we have time for a couple of questions? Two questions, maybe? Any questions? Uh, I think. Um, what is next for you guys? What are you guys working on next? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm working on uh, the the in in the kind of the clips that I kind of played the last film, um, which was Refuge, which I wrote in 2012 and 2014. We made, um, which was set in 2020. Um, we're developing that into a, a, a feature at this time, um, and I'm working on a few other. Yeah, it's free 99. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Persis. <laughs> Refuge. Refuge. Uh, the feature is going to be called Half Seen. Not half seen, but like half of something and seen. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what we are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, when I wrote the script, my script notes from PBS were, you shouldn't use the term NSA in the screenplay because no one's going to know what that is. You should use FBI. So just to give you a sense of the pre-Snowden world. Um, I'm working on a film called um, Fremont. It's an offbeat comedy with the same director as Radio Dreams, Babak Jalali. And it's about an Afghan girl, um, a refugee, former translator for the US military, who's now based here in San Francisco, working at a Chinese fortune cookie factory, writing fortunes. Um, you know, I, I started teaching as a full-time teacher since last August. So that took a lot of my time, and I teach two screenwriting classes. So right now I'm following 40 stories of my students, and my mind goes crazy with stories. So that's a big part of my life now, to teach students to write screenplays, if I know it well myself. Uh, but besides from that, I'm working on a feature screenplay that I'm hoping to like finish next year. Um, and at the same time, I, I love writing in Farsi, but short stories. So I had this short story that was published in Sand, which is a literary quarterly in Iran. 
um, last in the spring, and then um, I, I'm writing actually more stories in Farsi. So that's another long-term project. I'm hoping to have a collection of short stories in Farsi. So that's another thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.